So now on the main stage, we are glad to receive Samuel Newman, who is an expert about microservices, book author of building microservices and preparing some things uh, to talk about how to transition maybe monolith to microservices. Uh, so yeah, we're really glad to have you, Sam, uh, Samuel Newman. And yeah, I think the stage is yours and glad to hear your story about APIs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mehdi. Um, okay, well, welcome aboard, everybody. Um, now, we've online conferences are a new thing for many of us. Some of us have been doing it. We've been doing it a bit this year. We've had no other choice. Um, and uh, I'm, so I'm really glad so many of you have come along. And I, I saw the lineup for yesterday. It's a cracking lineup. So I really hope that I can set today off uh, in a good way and that you're going to enjoy the time our time together, however brief it may be. And I'm here to talk, I mean, I'm a microservices person, right? That's my background, but this is a, an API centric conference. So I was thinking, okay, how do I bring those, those worlds together? And so I, I've been looking, doing a lot of work, looking at how we make it easy to make microservices uh, independently deployable. That's been a big thing for me. And so my focus was really today on like, well, how, how do microservices line up with APIs and how we think about making changes happen. I've written some books in the past. You can find out about them on the internet. Uh, I'm working on the second edition of my Building Microservices book. Uh, I also run my own training advisory and consultancy uh, practice that I run mostly remotely at the moment uh, from the UK, although most of my clients are actually across Europe and in North America. Uh, I have a new book that was out at the end of last year that was really a deep dive into how you break apart existing monolithic applications. So if you've got a, a monolithic application you're trying to make smaller, go take a look at the book. But let's talk about just enough microservices, right? We're not, we haven't got long together. So let's just really just hone in on, on some of the aspects of microservices that I think are most interesting for this particular talk. Uh, and, and really, uh, for me, it always boils down to this idea of independent deployability. So I've got a services architecture here. I want to make a change in the functionality with one of my services, maybe the shipping service there. I go and make that change. I deploy the brand new shipping microservice. And I should be able to do that make that change, deploy that change without having to change anything else in my system. I'm not in the world of lockstep deployments or a distributed monolith. What I'm trying to do with the microservice architecture is achieve this outcome of independent deployability. And most of the other benefit benefits of microservice architectures flows from this idea. And so many of the choices we make are about making independent deployability a possibility, right? Well, if we zoom in and look at one microservice in isolation, uh, we typically we talk about a microservice being a process. So you all the code associated with the shipping of microservice we package together in a process. I might have multiple copies of that process for scale or robustness reasons. Um, the communication between those microservices is done via some kind of network call. Uh, we're here talking about APIs. You've been hearing about, you'll be hearing about GraphQL later today. You've been hearing about things like RPC and gRPC. This also could be messaging and other formats as well. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about the exact nature of those communication protocols, but it is some kind of network communication protocol. And we also, when we think about data, our data is hidden inside our microservice boundary. And by hiding that information about that data storage, amongst other things, we achieve this idea of independent deployability. When we think about a microservice, we can think of it therefore as a black box. I've got code and state hidden away inside that black box. And I expose that functionality to the rest of the world via something like an API. This could be a REST-based API, it could be a gRPC endpoint. I could also potentially choose to expose information via an external database, so maybe actually having a database as an endpoint, what some people call the reporting database pattern. I might emit events related to my microservice over something like Kafka or expose perhaps a request response uh, API over a queue um, for some kinds of protocols. But you know, the API, whatever that explicit service interface that we expose to the outside world, that's our way of deciding what data and what processes and what functionality is allowed to be hidden and what it can be accessed from the outside world. So this is our mechanism for saying, okay, you talk to me via this front door, right? You come in via this API, and I've got to make sure I maintain that API if I'm going to make changes, otherwise I'm going to break other people. So being really explicit about what those APIs are is quite important. One of the most important questions, the most common questions I get when I'm talking to people about microservices is, is sort of this question of how, how do you handle versioning? 
And really, when you dive into this, it's never really versioning because how do you handle versioning? One, that's a version. Two, that's another version. That's not really the question people are asking. What they're really saying is, uh, how do you handle change? Because one of the biggest challenges people have got in their heads is, how do I change one thing independently of other things? And what happens when I want to change one thing that needs other things to also change? How do I handle backwards compatibility and, you know, backwards incompatibility? Um, and that's what I want to share with you in this keynote is four concrete tips for how we handle changes with APIs in a microservices world. The very first tip is a really important one. And if you only remember one tip today, it should be this one, is that information hiding, the concept of information hiding is key. So when we think about two services communicating with each other, so here I've got the order processor is talking to my shipping service and I wanna make a change to that shipping service. I'm gonna deploy a brand new version of it. I want to make sure that the existing consumers of the shipping service can still function. I wanna make sure I haven't broken them in some way, shape or form. If I roll out a brand new version of the shipping service that has, is backwards incompatible in terms of the interface that it exposes, I'm gonna cause you know, potentially outages and lots of, uh, you know, annoyance to my colleagues. So if I want this property of independent deployability, I have to have a degree of interface stability. So as I change my microservice, I want to try and maintain backwards compatibility. So I want to make a change to my microservice and ensure that my old consumers can still use the newer version of my microservice. And this is in general. We'll talk about how we handle backwards incompatibility a bit later on. Now, one of the ways we achieve this, actually, and one of the concepts that underpins how we achieve this, goes all the way back to the early 1970s, and 1971 to be precise. This is work done by David Parnas uh, and, and, and developed what he called information hiding. David Parnas was looking at modular software. How do we create uh, software that's broken down into modules, where those modules can be worked on independently by different people, maybe by different teams, still ensure that those teams can work independently, but the modules still kind of fit together? So that work and research he did back in the early 70s um, actually led him to, uh, to uh, defining this concept called information hiding. The idea behind information hiding is within a module boundary, you should hide as much as possible. Uh, everything you hide from the outside world can be freely changed without affecting backwards compatibility. So when we think about that in a microservices world, we want to hide our secrets, hide as much as possible and be very explicit about what information we expose. So here's an, a, our microservice here. I've got data structures and logic and behavior inside my service boundary. And I've got data that I'm storing in a database. Along comes a consumer and they says, well, I want to get some of your stuff. And it reaches straight into my internal implementation details. Maybe I've exposed arbitrary objects from inside my service boundary. It's very easy to do. You know, some of the uh, uh, SOAP frameworks I used to use, for example, you only need to do is put one annotation on a class and that was immediately exposed in your WSDL. And now people can reach into your internal object states or even worse, reach and start straight into your database and start rummaging around in all your secrets. The problem in this world is if you're reaching into somebody else's internal implementation detail, when you're making changes to the account service, it becomes quite difficult to know what stuff can be changed freely and safely. If I make a change to my internal implementation that happen to be things that an external consumer was somehow using, I'm going to break compatibility. And when you allow people to reach in to get hold of all your secrets, uh, you've sort of lost the ability to distinguish between what data can be safely changed and what and what information and behavior and logic can be safely changed and what logic and behavior has to be very tightly, ca carefully controlled because it may affect other people. Information hiding is largely about being explicit. So here, you know, in the imagined world, all the stuff inside my green box, this is stuff that's hidden from the outside. Um, so you can't access my database. These objects are not exposed over a networked interface. What I've got is I've got this interface here. This is the things that I'm allowing to be shared with the outside world. This is what makes up my well-defined explicit service interface, which, you know, for sake of argument, could be an API. So I've got a REST based API, perhaps, and that is what I expose with the rest of the world. The shipping service talks to the account service via that interface. If I'm a developer working on this service, I can go change the bits inside the green box safely. 
as long as I maintain compatibility, as long as I understand that that shared interface must remain compatible, I'll be okay. So a lot of information hiding is just about being explicit. But it's also about remembering that it's much easier to expose information you'd previously hidden than it is for you to hide information you'd previously exposed. So in general, if you're not sure if you should share it, don't share it and you'll be happier. But fundamentally, information hiding makes independent deployability possible because it makes it easier to make changes without affecting the contracts between things and allows us to make those independent changes happen. We think about that mapping from APIs, you know, the API in that world is becomes our means of information hiding. In an object oriented system, we might implement information hiding using something like encapsulation and, uh, you know, your public and private, you know, uh, yeah, keywords, for example. With a microservice, we can do that with the API. Our, EPA, our API becomes our mechanism of information hiding. And we can take that uh, to, to sort of larger degrees. Here I've got an account service that account service exposes an API to the outside world and all of these external consumers are accessing the account service via the API. But I've been busy working on the account service and I think, you know what, I want to break the account service down into pieces. Well, why don't I do that? So I create a ledger service, a customer service, a supplier service, but I still maintain that API. As far as the services are that are talking to me from the outside world, these outside consumers, they're just talking to the accounts microservice. They're sort of unaware that the, the accounts microservice is now really a logical construct rather than a physical construct. That API still exists. There's lots of different ways you could implement this. I don't have to tell any of you how to do this. This is easy stuff, right? Inside that now logical accounts boundary, I've got these three services. They're not directly exposed to anybody. They're hidden. No one knows a supplier service exists. And the nice thing about that is, you know, I'm working on this account service and I think, you know what, actually splitting suppliers and customers apart, that was a bit too aggressive. It's causing us too much pain. Let's merge those things back together again. And guess what? The outside world never needs to know. So these APIs can also allow us to talk, do information hiding at a higher level as well, not just at an individual service level, but at, at the level of groups of services. And this can work especially well when you have one team that owns a service. So if I had a team that owned the account service, for example, having a team specific API that is maybe sort of uh, pulled together and aggregated together in a larger ecosystem can work really efficiently. It allows you to make changes and some fundamental changes to your internal implementation, like creating new services or merging them back together. And nobody outside of that needs to know about this. Our next tip is that the cost of change varies and you can't have a one size fits all approach to how you think about changing of your APIs. Uh, you know, not every change requires a huge meeting. Some changes are worse than others. And by the same token, some changes are easier than others. Think about a team that's working, that's got a few microservices that they own. That team wants to make a change in the API between two of these services. They can have a conversation amongst themselves, decide what changes want to be applied and roll that change out very easily. The coordination required to make that change and insert you know, so an API that's maybe used with inside a team, that's a very easy thing to do. The cost of change is low, the ceremony is low, the risk is low, it's much easier to manage. If I'm exposing though a microservice that exposes an API to another team inside my organization, and I'm gonna make a change to that service that maybe has a backwards incompatible effect and might require team B to now do some work to, to update what they do, I've now got another point of coordination with a separate team. That's going to cause me more effort, right? It's going to take me more time. The cost of change is higher. So when I'm exposing that outside of my team and that becomes magnified if I've got multiple teams that are all using my service. So this microservice, if I change its API now, I've potentially got a much bigger impact. The cost of change is getting higher and higher again. And this gets worse if we now start thinking about people using APIs outside of your organization. Somebody is reaching in and using your API, but they're now an external party. Can I make that change happen at all? Maybe the cost of changes, maybe it's something that has to involve a lot of ceremony. Maybe I have to renegotiate contracts. And, um, maybe I just can't ever change it. Um, I remember chatting to uh, one of the folks at Netflix who was looking after sort of the API side of Netflix. 
I was sharing a, the story about the fact that lots of um, ne- the old versions of the Netflix players that ran in set-top boxes in North America, they're running on really old versions of the Netflix API, but they can't update those clients because it would involve going into people's living rooms and updating the firmware on these old cable boxes. And that's just not going to happen. The cost of change there is so high that they just had to maintain really, really old versions of that API. When we're thinking about that cost of change then, you know, within a team, between teams within the same organization, now to external parties, that cost of change just gets worse. The risk associated with it gets worse. And this can be further magnified as you have more you know, consumers and as the ability of those external parties, it gets better or worse regarding their ability to make a change happen. So. This isn't a fixed number. This isn't, this is a sort of a linear, this is a spectrum disorder. This and these means there's some other, you know, uh, another way of categorizing decisions that I came across. And, and that's a sort of a distinction made by Jeff Bezos in a letter to, the, to Amazon shareholders a few years ago. He distinguished between type one and type two decisions. He described type one decisions as decisions that are like one way doors. This decision that we're going to make we can't undo it. It's going to be impossible to undo or nearly impossible to to, to undo. And therefore, it's going to require a lot of careful thought and attention. Whereas there are type two decisions which are like, well, they're easy to reverse. We can change our minds. Yeah, sure. It it may it's not going to be a zero cost to undo, but it's pretty trivially easy to fix that problem. So don't worry about it too much. And his kind of comment was that a lot of organizations treat all decision making as type one decisions, whereas in reality, they're not. Some decisions are type one decisions and require lots of careful thought. And some just do not need that level of rigorous, critical thinking. I don't necessarily like the term type one and type two decisions. I I tend to to talk instead about reversible and irreversible decisions. So, you know, reversible decisions are things that we can undo we can change our minds about easily irreversible ones are ones we can't and we can think about our api change again on that spectrum you know at the reversible end of the spectrum we've got changes that happen inside a team boundary inside a team if they decide to change their minds about an api good good luck to them they can work that out themselves who else needs to get involved no one leave them to it whereas those things that are getting more externally used or public facing apis Changing your mind about those things is pretty, that's a big deal. So leave your internal team changes, your more reversible decisions. Allow those decisions to be made in the teams. Allow ad hoc internal teams to make the judgment calls about that. There's no need for top down processes and procedures to happen. But when you start looking at your public facing APIs, you're going to need a lot more to conversation and discussion. You may even need things like formal approval about those changes. Now, if you get that balance right, between working out which decisions fall into which bucket or where they fall along that spectrum, it allows you to start looking and making your organization much more autonomous. And that's a big reason why lots of organizations adopt microservices. They want to push decision-making responsibility into the teams, allowing them to make decisions and go fast. That's only possible if you give up some central control. If every single decision you make is a type one decision, it's always going to be centrally made and you're never going to empower your teams. So finding that balance, letting teams take more responsibility for themselves is key to getting to thriving from having more and increased te- uh, degrees of team autonomy um, and, and just getting you're getting your eye in, in a way of knowing where we are going to be on this spectrum. And it might be about saying, well, look, these APIs are much need much more oversight. These ones don't. Or these microservices are more critical than these other microservices. And that might be as straightforward as you need to get. Our third tip is to do whatever you can to avoid accidental breakages in your APIs and your contracts that services expose. We'll talk about how to manage, you know, conscious decision, conscious backwards incompatible changes. But we want to catch those unconscious decisions that we made about making changes. So like the accidents, what are our safety nets here to catch us if we fall? Here's a classic example of sort of accidental breakages that I see all the time when it comes to sort of uh, API based microservices. So here I've got a a bit of code. I've got some fields in my Java. This is a bit of Java code, right? I've snipped out the offending details. And I've got three fields here, got an ID, a name and an age. And uh, it's quite common to take a data structure like this and serialize it into something like JSON, 
Now, JSON's not a particularly good serialization format, but it's very popular and widely used, so let's talk about it, right? So we can see here the mapping between these two things is quite straightforward, and I could hand roll that mapping easily enough, but probably you're gonna make use of some library or some piece of code that could automatically do this for you because it's gonna save you time, right? Um, so those fields are directly mapped in that class, are directly mapped to fields that are now available over our API. A developer comes along and looks at that customer class and goes, hang on a minute, we're storing the age as an integer, but what happens if it's midnight and it ticks over and now it's their birthday and we've got to increase the age? That's all gonna get quite confusing. Maybe it makes more sense for us to actually store the age as a year, month, day instead. So I have a date of birth field instead. They go and make that change in the code. The code all compiles, but of course we're automatically or auto magically mapping this into JSON. And now rather than sharing a JSON payload where we had an age field, we're now sharing a date of birth field instead. Now it might be more correct, but that's a backwards incompatible change. A way to have made that change compatible would have been to sort of backwards compatible would be to still share the age in the payload. And maybe you could add on the date of birth. But if it's not obvious to a developer that making that change in code changes the JSON payload, they might quite innocently do what looks like a straightforward refactoring that breaks a public contract. Doing things like being explicit about what things get serialized, maybe having annotations on those fields, say this is a serialized field, it gets serialized as this, at least that's making it more explicit to the developer about what is shared and what is hidden. Again, making part of that, making information hiding, making that more explicit. There are other things you can do here, like having explicit data transfer objects. So I have my internal classes or objects which are hidden. I then might map that into a form that can be exposed. And I actually like hand rolling that mapping because then if I do make a change to my internal objects, I have to explicitly go and make a change to my data transfer object to make a change in what is shared publicly. It should be a bit more work and a bit more ceremony if you're going to make a change to your the API that you're exposing from a microservice. A DTO is one way of making that translation really, really explicit. And it might seem like a lot of work that you could just magic away, but sometimes making these things a bit manual is a good way of putting it very much, making it very visible to a developer that you're doing something you're going to have to think about carefully. This is also why I'm a big fan of having explicit schemas. I like having a schema. Right. So if I've got two services talking to each other, I want an explicit understanding of what my consumer wants of my service. Having a schema can help because the schema says, here's what I exposed. Here are my fields. This is what I do. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably using JSON over HTTP, for example. The problem is in moving away from XML, we got rid of some good stuff as well. We got rid of schemas, but you can use schemas. You can look at things like JSON schema. I, it works. It's not perfect, but it's better than not having a schema. Uh, if you're using, of course, protobuffer serialization, you already have a really, really nice schema format that is really quite neat and clean. Having an explicit schema catches so many of these accidental breakages. It makes it a concrete effort or a concrete step to change that API. You really will be surprised about how much you reduce your accidental breakages using schemas. Now, of course, another big part of this is testing. But if you have a schema, your schema validation and things will catch a lot of your low hanging fruit in this area. Testing is, a, is a, as well as. You can just do testing. And if you have no schemas, your tests are gonna have to bear a greater burden. They're also gonna have to catch your incidental structural breakages. But let's imagine you've done all the work required to stop those accidental breakages and you actually are now gonna make a change that may change compatibility of your API. So what do you do? So here I've got a, a microservice returns, which exposes some kind of endpoint. And I realize I've got to change that endpoint, it's rubbish. I've got a brand new API, it's been much better. Um, and, I, and I got the, but I've got a consumer, that's what I do. Well, I could say, well, look, we're rolling out a brand new version with a new endpoint. We need you to redeploy your service at exactly the same time. So this is a lockstep release. And this is like, let's go three, two, one, and deploy, right? And lockstep releases are not great, right? Because they require more coordination. There's more risk. It also makes things like zero downtime deployments much more complicated, especially if you're trying to do this across multiple teams. And this ultimately is the enemy of independent deployability. It might okay, be okay though for changes within a team, but across team boundaries, you absolutely want to avoid this. We want independent deployability and lockstep deployments is the antithesis 
of independent deployability. So that's what we're trying to do. We want to achieve independent deployability. It kind of therefore follows that if we're going to change our API in a way which is backwards incompatible, that we basically need to give our consumers time to upgrade so we don't have that lockstep deployment. So this leads us to our fourth and final tip. Expose multiple endpoints to deal with backwards incompatible changes. So if you think why, if, if having one front door to your service is OK, why not have two? We want to be able to have coexist incompatible versions of an API at the same time. There's a couple of key ways I see this being done. I, I favor one over the other, but I'll share both of them with you. The first is just to say, well, let's just deploy a, set of, a, a whole other set of copies of our microservices. So here, the return service, I'm rolling out a brand new version of that endpoint. Well, let's just deploy another set of returns services. So we've got returns v1 is running and returns v2 is running. Returns v1 exposes the old endpoint. Returns v2 exposes the new endpoint. And so now our, we give our, our consumers time to decide to upgrade, right? We could give them a few weeks, a few months, whatever else. And when they're ready, they redeploy their service, which is now talking to the new endpoint, at which point we could retire the old uh, version one set of our microservices. There's a few challenges with this approach. The first is, is kind of an easy problem, which is that service discovery aspect. It's not enough for the customer service to know where is the return service. I've now got to know where is the return service, which has the version one endpoint. And so typically, you know, under the hood, I'm looking for a, a, probably an IP and port mapping, right? Um, easy to fix. The next problem here, though, is money. Worst case, you're doubling the amount of infrastructure required to run your return service. If you've got excess capacity, that's absolutely fine. But if you're sort of spinning things up on demand to the public cloud, uh, provider, you almost certainly won't have that much excess capacity. This will therefore probably result in you spending more money. And that gets exacerbated the longer you have to coexist these two things. So if you've got consumers that are going to take a long time to upgrade, then you could be paying that cost for a much longer period of time. The third issue is data. If this return service wants to manage data and you want to see a consistent set of data between both versions of these endpoints, you're going to need to maintain data compatibility between these two versions of the service as well. And that's a problem that becomes more difficult the longer this goes on for. The final issue with this approach is the bug fixing problem. If I have a critical defect that I've got to roll out, I've now potentially got to change that in multiple different places. It becomes more difficult. The model I prefer is to say, well, one microservice can explore, expose more than one endpoint. So I'm going to deploy a brand new version of the return service that exposes both the old endpoint and the new endpoint. But it's running from the same process. So I, that still gives my consumer time to upgrade and switch over to a new version. From their point of view, from the consumer point of view, both of these models are exactly the same. But from a maintenance and management point of view of the return service, I think this model is much cleaner. I don't have the additional concerns about cost. I don't have the concerns about data compatibility. I still got the service discovery aspect to deal with. But again, that gets solved the same way of either approach. Fundamentally, I've shifted for, uh, the problem here from being about managing more infrastructure to actually putting a bit of a design abstraction into my service to handle how I can host two uh, APIs at once. This is not hard. And this model works really well if you've got consumers that are not going to upgrade or can't upgrade very quickly. I spoke to a price comparison company in the north of England, and they use this approach for services that sit on the perimeter of their system to expose APIs to third parties. And they say, look, a lot of those third parties are never going to change their APIs. We've got some of these services that emulate old APIs going back five or 10 years. And the model works really, really well. So in summary, four key tips, right? Information hiding is key to making independent deployability a reality. So information hiding is the one thing I want you to remember out of this talk. Um, the cost of change varies. Understand the cost of change in your organization and adapt your processes and where the responsibility lies accordingly. Catch accidental breakages. Schemas are great. Testing is good too. Schemas plus testing is fantastic. Um, and finally, if you do need to make backwards incompatible changes, you've got to work out ways to coexist different versions of that API to allow for independent deployability. I hope this was useful. There's loads more information about what I do over my website, including links to my books and lots more free talks online. Uh, but thank you so much for your time.
Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for uh, this talk. Uh, I think it was great. Uh, in the two minutes, we have uh, like three questions. I know it's hard. Uh, what do you think of Dayper.io, where all the non-functional concerns are addressed by out-of-process sidecar? Um, I, you can't address all non-functional concerns with sidecars. So that non-functionals cut across security, cut across latency, accessibility. You, sidecars don't solve your problems. Service meshes won't solve all your problems. Kubernetes won't solve all your problems. They might solve some problems. Yeah. Uh, how do you solve the service discovery issue with multiple versions? It depends on which service discovery scheme you're picking. If you're building, say, a REST-based API, pretty easy, right? You can stick the version number for the endpoint in your URI path. You can stick it in the accept header. In some environments, I've actually put it in a subdomain. Um, if you're using a dynamic service discovery tool like console, for example, that's really easy. It's just another key. So a lot depends on your routing. Um, I've actually, I know it's, I know the rest of Farians don't always like it. I like being explicit sometimes and putting that version number in the path, although there are some downsides to that. Uh, one quick question. Uh, can you do this with GraphQL or do we need to use RESTful always? That's the question. Uh, uh, it's not, nothing I've shared with you is specific to REST. It, I've done this with Kafka topics. I've done it with um, uh, gRPC endpoints. I've done it with REST APIs. GraphQL gets kind of interesting in that GraphQL doesn't really like the idea of having kind of distinct versioning. The way you'd end up having to do it with GraphQL would probably be to coexist two separate GraphQL backends. It's a little bit more hazy for me. Look, there's a graph curl super interesting, but there's a bunch of unanswered questions around it. This is something I'm only yet sort of dipping my toe into. Last one. Uh, have you heard about mini services, right? A little bit like a little bit bigger than, than micro, but actually if the hiding is as important as the exposing, how do you put the right level? I've heard of mini services. I've heard of macro services. I've heard of nano services. I've heard, it, it, they're all kind of meaningless, meaningless terms. I mean, look, let's, let the, I don't know what it means, so I can't help you, right? Um, my, microservices don't, I, this is the problem though. Microservices implies size, and I wish I could go back in time and rename them. Um, what microservices are really about is the independent deployability aspect of it. Um, I think far too many people say, how many lines of code is it? And that's meaningless. So I, you know, I've, I don't think those terms mean much. Some companies want bigger microservices than others. La last one, should we call them indie service? <laughs> like indie service. Independent. Uh, that's a, th th that would be better. So if we could go back to 2012, we could probably fix this problem. So if any of you invent a time machine, please do let me know. We can get this fixed. Yeah, but naming is one of the, the three main problems, right? So yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. So